Hello and welcome to the Homeless Consultant channel. My name is Paul B. I am the Homeless Consultant. Today, uh, since the state of Minnesota denied me my constitutional right to vote in 2016, and all indicators are that nothing has changed for 2020, since I can't cast a vote, I thought I would at least make my contribution by giving you my opinions on the race between Angie Craig, the incumbent U.S. representative from Minnesota for the 2nd District of Minnesota, and her Republican challenger, Tyler Kistner. As I went to put this together, the amount of things I found quickly, very quickly, that I could say about Angie Craig was so much that I had to trim most of it off. I just can't let the video go that long. But I do need to start with one brief, uh, I don't want to call it a story because the story sounds like it could be fictional, and it's not. When Governor Tim Waltz instituted his stay-at-home order about seven months ago, something like that, in my office, I was the only person who could not work at home because I'm homeless. I don't have a home. And you see, if you're an individual who doesn't even think in terms of the homeless, the homeless are not quite human, they're not worthy of your thought, that just doesn't enter your mind, then you might institute something like a stay-at-home order, which has punishments for people who do not stay at home, you know, like um, uh, the homeless, for example. So when I went to Governor Waltz's office, I got zero satisfaction. I got a phone conversation with a girl who pretended to be nice, uh, gave me her cell phone number to get me off the phone, said call if you need anything, and it turned out to be a non-working number. My next step was to go to what I thought was my representative, Angie Craig, in the U.S. Congress. So I called them up. I was on the phone for about a half hour with another very nice girl who listened to everything and seemed to understand, kind of. Um, she passed that on, and then a couple days later I got an email from Angie Craig's office, not from Angie Craig, but from another intern or staffer, and it was, a, uh, it was a, quite a slap in the face. The questions I was calling about were dealt with the stay-at-home order being life-threatening to me, and frankly, possibly to up to 20,000 homeless people in Minnesota. The response I got was a very poorly worded, grammatically incorrect, what looked to be cut and pasted, I mean it wasn't even formatted properly, look at it, response that did nothing but send me to social services. And if you watch my videos, you'll see all over the place where I show you how much value Minnesota so social services are, particularly for a oh, white, well-educated, sober, hard-working, you know what I mean. It did not address the issues that I had raised in the phone call at all. It was completely irrelevant. They heard, what, apparently what happened was, Angie Craig's office heard when they got the notes from this girl I spoke with at length, they looked through, skimmed it, and said, homeless. And they just went to their little Rolodex, you know, like if you're in a call center, you have a flip chart for how to respond to any particular call, and they just cut and pasted it over, didn't even bother to format it or anything. Here, go to these social services. And, you know, one of the things it said in that message was, um, let's see, I think I have it right here. Give me a moment. Yeah. Additionally, Ally Family Services runs a hoteling program for certain qualifying Dakota County residents. Um, as I just said, I'm a single guy, no children. Uh, Ally Family Services? hoteling program for certain qualifying and it says I have attached their intake form to this email their intake form in other words Paul I want you to put your personal information into yet another system that is associated with poverty social services welfare even though you have never taken welfare or unemployment insurance or anything from the government you want to work for a living that's the response I got from Angie Craig's office. So I wrote back, and I did another video at length, I won't read the whole thing here, but I wrote back another, um, I just, in this case, I just wrote it like I would in business. 
and I wrote out in bullet points exactly what I had mentioned on that call that mattered. Primarily that the stay at home order targeted the homeless like a laser beam. I was the only person out of a hundred people in my office who could not work at home. I was the only person who lost my job. And the only reason for it is because I'm homeless and it's built into the DNA of these people who run Minnesota to just not even think about the homeless. They don't care. They could live, they could die, as long as they do it somewhere else, they don't care. That's what I wrote in my second response. It was very pointed and at the end I said... At the end I said, and I'm sorry if they don't want to hear this, but given the response I got the first time, this was absolutely appropriate. It is obvious from your response that either the life-threatening nature of my call was not communicated to you or that this is no, of no concern to you. Do you know of a third option? Either it was not communicated to them or it didn't matter because homeless people don't matter. If you have specific answers to assist me with the attacks Governor Waltz has perpetrated against me, then please Help to save my life by addressing the specific issues I called about. I am a professional. I expect those in Representative Craig's office to function as professionals as well. And to get these serious issues remedied without delay. And these are incredibly serious. I don't even have time in a video to go into what the consequences of this stay at home, or home order have been on me. But they are severe and dire. My response to this, where I put the bullet points and everything to Angie Craig's office, was nothing whatsoever, ever again. Never heard a word from them again, except for, at this point, and I think I've already deleted a couple, but what I can count in my email right now, 21 marketing emails from Representative Angie Craig, each and every one of which is asking me to help her with her agendas. And they're still coming. They're still coming in. So they put me on their mailing list. I never asked for that, did I? I never asked for that. I asked for help to save my life. If you have an employee who engages in sloth and negligence, an employee who doesn't do their job, they refuse to do their job, and when you ask them to do their job twice, they just hide and they stop even responding to you. And yet, they'll still slip the little donation form for maybe their pet charity or something on your desk when you're not there. Because they expect you to help them. But they will never help you or the company, the people who employ them, the people who pay their paychecks. If you have an employee like that, what do you do with that individual? You fire them. You get rid of them. If I'm running a business and my family's well-being depends on the performance of my employees and I was taught this early on in my business career thank goodness one of my wonderful mentors I've had been blessed with fantastic business mentors one of them said you choose your employees based on would you hire this person if you own the company and your family's prosperity and well-being depended on their performance that's how you decide who you're gonna vote who you're gonna uh, hire for your business Based on Angie Craig's performance, you couldn't pay me enough money to hire her into my business. There's no competence here, there's no caring, there's no empathy, there's no humanity, there's no concern, there's no action. There's nothing. And, you know, the, the cheerleaders for Minnesota or for Angie Craig can come in and watch these videos and throw a bunch of thumbs downs on these, dislikes on these videos all they want. That doesn't matter, I could care less. But that doesn't change the fact I have just presented to you, showing you the emails. The fact that Angie Craig did nothing. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, and I mean the grace of God, this stay-at-home order could have had consequences that would mean I am not speaking to you right now and probably not speaking to anybody ever again. That man put my life at risk. I went to her for help, and I got nothing. Now let's look at what we can see about Angie Craig from, I just, all I did, I went to her campaign site, Wikipedia, I went to Tyler Kirstner's, um, uh, uh, you know, website, bio, and uh, YouTube channel. 
And that's all I've looked at. I considered contacting Tyler and seeing if he would meet with me first, but it isn't fair. He's not a public servant yet. He's not my employee, because I pay taxes when I work, right? I pay Angie Craig's salary, and yet she did nothing. She asked me to help her instead, because it's all about her. It wasn't fair to contact Tyler when he's trying to run a campaign to bring these issues up to him. He's got other things to concern himself with. So I just went on the details there. Now let's look at what we have, and here's where I just... I don't know where to begin and I don't know where to end, so I'm going to try to keep this brief. But I will say, if you've watched my video, the 50 greatest existential threats to the United States of America, threats to our very continued existence as a free, prosperous country that generally gives a quality of life to its citizens that the world just hadn't seen before. Threats to the existence of that. When you go through those 50 existential threats, Angie Craig is intimately related or a supporter or if not just actively pursuing a very, very large number of those existential threats. And when it came to Tyler Kirstner, I couldn't find one. I couldn't even find even one. The closest thing I could find was the fact that he went to college at all. And you look at one of the existential threats is our horrific education system which is nothing more than an indoctrination system. But he, he went to college. That's not actively pursuing an existential threat. Like so many else out there, including myself, he probably didn't know how bad our education system was until he got out of it. And sometimes you can get at least an adequate education. My undergraduate wasn't all that bad. It was, but anyway, not to go there. But So I couldn't find anything in Tyler Kirstner's bio or his resume here that was even related to any of the 50 existential threats. But with Angie Craig, they were all over the place. Almost every line she wrote, bing, existential threat. And that should be an alarm bell for people who actually care. And remember, existential threat, I believe number one, was cults and cult mentalities. One of the most well-known cult behaviors out there is political parties. If you go into the voting booth and you just say, well, I'm a Democrat, ding, 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 Democrats down the line. You don't know who they are, what they stand for. You don't know whether they work hard or if, as in the case of Angie Craig, they do absolutely nothing while collecting a paycheck. Or you go down the Republican line the same way, ding, 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 and you just choose every Republican. And you haven't researched the people. That's a cult behavior. So if you're going to engage in that kind of thing, you are going to re reap the rewards that you deserve. But the problem is, people like me are also going to reap those rewards. And all the people out there. So please, I urge you, let that cult mentality go. Find the best person for this job. I've voted for Democrats before. I've voted for a libertarian once. I mean, given the circumstances, you have to vote for the best person for the job of the ones you have to choose from. One of the big issues I had with Angie Craig was in her biography, it was very vague and it was very emotional. She, she was storytelling. She was telling, she was describing her life and, oh, I struggled and I worked hard and I had these strong women role models and she just goes through all this stuff and it wasn't really telling you anything. It just affected the emotions. And when you got the things like, she was very vague, you know, I worked as a reporter, and then where was this line that was so important? Worked my way up over 20 years in business to lead a workforce of 16,000 for a major Minnesota manufacturer. And the first thing I thought when I, based on my business background, first thing I thought of when I thought of that was, okay, well, either as she rose through the ranks, somehow she had 16,000 direct reports over all that time or the business was set up so poorly that it had way too many direct reports for any manager to be able to effectively you know administer something was dreadfully wrong here either this company was ghastly or something's wrong with the way she's presenting these numbers and I, I got thinking in my head and I was just trying to think well you know I mean she's working in medical I found out later she's working in medical She's working at St. Jude. I worked 
before I became homeless, the job I had was working for one of the competitors for St. Jude, another medical company. And I know there that, you know, a vice president, you could get a vice president out of a vending machine in the, in the cafeteria there. They had this big, huge area with all these vice presidents. They came and they went. They had maybe three, four, five, six, two direct reports each. The president, the president overseeing all these thousands of people, never interacted with those people. So how in the world did she lead a workforce of 16,000 over 20 years? She would have to get a promotion like every three months and be leading, you know, 500, 1,000 people each time, different people. And how do you gauge her performance if she's only led people for that amount? Of, you see what I'm saying? There's something wrong with that number. And if you think about it, you would recognize that instead of just glossing over it. The number doesn't jive with the way that a competent business works. And as far as I know, St. Jude is at least competent. Now, if you go to a Wikipedia page, you find out a piece of information she didn't provide that becomes very relevant. Her job there was in human resources and communications. One of my existential threats is corporate corruption, inhumanity, and dehumanization. I was never able at this time to give a detailed account of that particular existential threat. I only got through about 10 of them so far. But when I get into that, human resources is probably 80% of it. Not the big corp, not the big executives or the stockholders, human resources. Just the name human resources. You are a resource to be used and consumed and discarded at will. When we went from personnel to human resources, everything became dehumanized. Human resources. You will do this or else. You will do that or else. You will go to this sensitivity training program. You will do, which has nothing to do with your competence at your job, does it? She was in human resources, one of the greatest existential threats in America in terms of its impact on how corporate America has become so dehumanized. And even people on the left are constantly yelling and screaming about corporate America, as every American should be. But they're, point, they're looking in the wrong direction. They're looking at those executives. The, the, the president who sits there and deals with maybe 20 people out of the whole company. These vice presidents that you go up there and put a couple bucks in the vending machine and push a button. Here comes the vice president of analog communications, whatever. They give them these silly names. And then they're gone eight months later. Why didn't she tell you all that in the original bio, folks? Why didn't she tell you that? Another thing that really met me was another big number. In the bullet points of, she says, since coming to Congress, which was two years ago, not even quite two years ago, actually, is it? Because she didn't take office till January. So more like a year and a half by the time she wrote this. She says, I am proud to have, and she lists out these things, but one really caught my eye. Two, two caught my eye. One was met with over 10,000 Minnesotans. And again, as someone who was trained to think, that number just jumped right out at me as suspicious. Why? Because when I hear that, I think in terms of time. Okay, two years, or more like a year and a half, but let's give her the benefit of the doubt. Let's give her two years, even though two years isn't for several months yet. But um, she's in office for two years in Washington, D.C. Not in Minnesota, but in Washington, D.C. And yet she met with 10,000 Minnesotans. What does that mean? How did she have time to actually do her job? Because another one of her bullet points says that she co-sponsored more than more than 500 bills. And she adds in this little writer here that says, over three quarters of which were bipartisan. That's a distraction. That's a distraction. For one thing, it doesn't mean anything until you research it, but let's put that out of the way. Let's look at that first part. Co-sponsored more than 500 bills. The only book I have in this car right now is this Bible. This is about the size of a typical bill in Congress. My understanding is that the Obamacare bill was stood something like five or six feet tall. She's been there two years and she's co-sponsored more than 500 bills. That means about one bill every 
1.25 days. And if you, if, you, if you don't give her the benefit of the doubt, the fact that she hasn't filled out two years yet, that basically means one bill every single day she has co-sponsored. That means every single day she has read a bill that ranges from maybe you know, 10, 20 pieces of paper to something like this. She has researched it. She's validated it. She's done all the things you need to know whether or not this is a good bill or not in order to make an informed, thoughtful, well-educated decision on whether to co-sponsor that bill. Every single day, for two years, one of these bills. And meanwhile, she's able to meet with 10,000 Minnesotans and do her job sitting in congressional you know, hearings. She's on all these committees, sitting in those hearings. Uh, sessions of Congress, voting, public speaking engagements, um, interviews with the media, meeting with uh, people, uh, lobbyists, which, you know, if you look at my last junk science video where I talk about the way that lobbyists go in and they basically purchase these congresspersons. All the things she has to do. And then on top of that, she has to go to the doctor, to the dentist, to the grocery store. She has to spend some kind of time with her family, presumably. She has driving from here to there. Have you ever timed how, when you're driving how long you sit at stoplights? If you do the math, you'll find out that someone who lives in a metro era, area, even though we live longer today, it's about six months of your life that you spend sitting at red lights. Did you know that? All these things Angie Craig has going on, and yet somehow, by some miracle of space-time, she's able to meet with 10,000 Minnesotans and intelligently co-sponsor more than 500 bills. One bill every day. She knows everything that's in here. She knows whether it's accurate or not. She's researched it. She knows exactly what's going on. She can make, have enough confidence to say, I will put my name on that bill. Let's talk about this meeting with 10,000 Minnesotans thing. Since when I just emailed, I wasn't even meeting in the last six months, I've gotten zero response. Now, if that's her performance there, how did she manage to meet with 10,000 Minnesotans? Meet with them. Hi, hi. Well, I guess today you can't. You have to use your elbow, right? Meet with them. Sit down and talk to them and hear what their concerns are, which you have to do for probably at least a good 10, 15, 30 minutes to really really truly understand what this person is going through and what they need and to have the dialogue back and forth to truly understand what's happening and then when you leave that you're gonna write all this down you take your notes you have to delegate tasks to your staff on behalf of this constituent you're, you're telling me she did that for 10,000 Minnesotans while going through all this every single day every single day every single work day for two years on these bills, researching, validating everything. You know, because, I mean, the alternative, obviously, is what I put in my last junk science video about lobbying, which is that these 500 bills basically come, they're written by lobbyists, special interests, you know, like the pharmaceutical industry, for example. Where they come in and they meet with you and they wine and dine you and take you out to the theater, maybe put a little money in your coffers for your re-election, That kind of fits in a little better with 500 bills, doesn't it, than someone who's actually reading the bills. There was a book written, it was published in like 1972, 1974, somewhere in there, by a former congressman that was called, What Makes You Think We Read the Bills? We were warned about this half a century ago, folks. This is what's called the swamp. A responsible person reads the bills. They know what they're signing, they know what they're voting for, and they know whether it's going to hurt or help people. How is that even possible? One bill a day for two years while meeting with 10,000 Minnesotans and going about her life and everything else. Remember, one third of that time asleep. The mathematics does not support the idea that what she's telling you here is accurate. Infer from that what you will. One of the quotes on her, uh, her uh, campaign spiel here says, quote, 
it's disappointing that so many politicians seem content to sit back and do nothing but fight among themselves over petty politics. It's disappointing that so many politicians seem content to sit back and do nothing. I just wanted to stop there because the, the, the uh, clause at the end of that statement doesn't really matter, right? It's disappointing that so many politicians seem content. They're perfectly happy to do it, to sit back and do nothing. What did she do when I came to her for help saving my life? and possibly the lives of countless other homeless people, nothing. She sat back and did nothing. And apparently she was content to do so. She hasn't made up for it in the last six months. The only thing she's done is sent me marketing emails asking me to help her. Fight among themselves over petty politics. My understanding is that she has voted consistent with the presidential administration 5% of the time. 5% of the time she has agreed with the Trump administration in her voting. So e either everything Trump's doing is just completely wrong, completely wrong, like the people with Trump derangement syndrome would say, or if you got people who are a little more stable, 5%, does, does that really jive right, or does it seem like maybe she's nitpicking over petty politics? the very thing she's accusing other people of doing. Um, her work experience at the beginning, when she talks about being a newspaper reporter, one of my existential threats, what they today call the fake news, but basically a constitutionally protected free press that has been hijacked by special interests who ha are now using this press instead of to inform the people they're using it as a propaganda and manipulation tool to direct and take control over public policy which is sedition a capital offense by the way that was her first job she mentions in here working for that media she mentions quote build a Minnesota for all of us where every member of every fam family has an outstanding education. Build a Minnesota for all of us. Does that include me, Representative Craig? Because you never got back to me the last six months when I asked you for help. And if it weren't by the grace of God that a miracle happened, I might not be here today. It says right here, build a Minnesota for all of us or is, is that just rhetoric is that just emotional speak to try to get people's blood going to vote for you without actually taking the time to think about it or research anything where every member of every family has an outstanding education existential threat I think it was number four or number seven our horrifically rotten education system that indoctrinates rather than educating teaches no critical thinking skills teaches no research skills teaches no independent thought punishes students who demonstrate independent thought and ideas where every member of every family has an outstanding education you had mentioned how uh, as well as working two jobs when you were in college you used a little bit of student loans. Student loan racketeering, I think it was existential threat number three. Tied right in there with our rotten education system. The commercialization of education becoming a money-making bonanza. What, what are you talking about when you say every member of every family should have an outstanding education? Because I don't see anything in here where you're talking about setting fire to our education system until it's ashes, blowing them away and rebuilding something that actually works to create competent citizens. All, all I get is this one sentence, which is rather emotional, isn't it? Manipulative. Who doesn't want a good education for their every member of their family? But I don't see where you're going to give it to them. I don't see where you even comprehend what the problem is in the first place. Why they're not going to get a good education. I might just have to leave it at that, folks. Again, I could go on this forever, but there's existential threats all over the place. Her blind belief, her blind faith in what they call today science, which is really junk science, 
I don't see any evidence that she understands the distinction between legitimate science and junk science. What it means to prove something versus to use manipulative tactics, rhetoric, and propaganda to persuade somebody to believe something. There's a difference between proving something and persuading to believe. Existential threat. Existential threat. Suicidal trade agreements. On her page, she was bragging about how she was voting for a trade agreement between Mexico, United States, and Canada. Sounds a lot like NAFTA, doesn't it? I'm going to leave it at that in the interest of time. But folks, for everything I've said here, if nothing else, the proven fact that she left me to die when I went to her for help, and the proven fact that the numbers she gave us here, the 16,000 people she supposedly led a workforce as a human resource person, you call that leading? You call that leading people? 10,000 Minnesotans she's met with. I will say one more thing on that. In my video where I talked about Amy Klobuchar as a potential presidential candidate, I told you the true story. In fact, I documented it quite well, didn't I? How when I was at the medical company that I was at, Al Franken and Amy Klobuchar both came there. And what did they do? They went in and behind closed doors in the nice oak-finished boardroom, and they had a meeting with our executives. Who knows what transpired there? She had both of them, Aunt Franken and Klobuchar. They had this army of interns, all like wearing dark suits, just looking like a mafia, just sycophants, just follow interns, staffers, all the young kids, young boys, all these boys that Klobuchar had around her. Franken, same thing, just, and then they come out after that meeting, and we as employees are put in this room, the congressperson walks out in front of a podium and starts talking, and then at the end, they have a very, very brief question-answer period. You're in your workplace, the executives were just in there lobbying this person to do something that benefits the company and their stock value, their shareholders' value. If you're sitting in that chair and you raise a hardball question to that person, how long are you going to have your job? If you say, you know, Senator Klobuchar, why did you vote for this when it had this impact on these people and these people died as a result of it? If you raise that question in that environment, you're going to lose your job. And they know it because what they're doing is they're going, they're broadcasting and at taxpayer expense pretending that this is a fact-finding mission to help local business in Minnesota. They travel at taxpayer expense to this company, they sit in there and do the real thing with the executives, and then they come out and they do what with us? They campaign. And taxpayers pay for it. That whole stop is a campaign stop. And it's a completely controlled campaign stop. It's not out in the open, a real true town hall, a Lincoln-Douglas debate. No one can stand up and ask hardball questions. They will lose their job if they do. Is that how Angie Craig managed to somehow miraculously meet with over 10,000 Minnesotans in one year and nine months while doing all this other stuff? You know, the, the one bill a day research and validation and knowing exactly what it is she's putting her name on. Never just putting her name on something that, say, a lobbyist handed to her and maybe made a contribution to her re-election campaign in exchange for the vote. Right? Let's talk about Tyler Kirstner. His focus for his campaign is his experience primarily with the Marines. He was nine years in the service with the Marines, um, basically special forces, the Marine Raiders. Uh, he married his high school sweetheart, has a daughter and a son on the way. Married his high school sweetheart. I'll leave it to you to think about what that means in terms of someone's capacity for commitment to another person over the long haul. Think about it. It's not just a bunch of Christians talking about family values and all this. There's a practical reason why these things matter, folks. 
he mentions, now when he gives his biography, instead of touching your emotions and all that, he more or less tells you why these things are relevant to his ability to serve as a congressman. For example, he points out that when you're in special forces, you're operating in a high stress situation and chaotic environments. Have you seen anything that seems kind of high stress or chaotic in our government over the last year? Look at the way people have responded. These people who, with the Trump derangement syndrome, they're just blah, screaming and yelling, going crazy, acting like infants. Can you do that? Or someone who has their head squarely on their shoulders and they're stable. Instead of going out there and yelling, like the videos I saw of Angie Craig, she was basically out there just yelling, just, just kind of sniveling and, and angry and upset. And I just thought, why would I want to spend time listening to them? It's, this woman just makes me so unhappy. I mean, everything's, the sky's falling for her. But someone who's a Marine in that environment, they have to be able to operate in a high stress environment, chaotic environments. They have to be able to function professionally. Nine years in there and he became a leader within it, I think it's proven that he did it. Because if you're not aware, if you don't do that in the Marines, you're not going to last very long. There's people's lives on your line, online, based on your performance. People can die if you don't perform well. And even if you do perform well, some people under you might die. It's a dangerous job. This man took a lot of risk. He has this lovely wife and this daughter, and he put himself at risk every day of losing his life and leaving them behind. But he did it so that that family and everyone around him would have a better life. That's different than going into, say, human resources where your main job is to use all of the psychological manipulation against people, trying to prevent them from raising any kind of internal ruckus, like, I don't know, like where I was, if we're doing something that, say, building a device that might, oh, kill a patient, for example, and you raise the issue, and the first thing they do is send in their, their, their version of the military and corporations, human resources. Well, you know, if you have a problem with this company, you can always work somewhere else while you're trying to save lives. That's human resources. That's Angie Craig's past. Tyler Kirshner is out there with people who have machine guns pointed at him and the people he's charged with protecting. I have nothing but respect for the military. As a Marine, he understands command and control. He understands tactics and strategy. Something that these people who just fly off the handle when something happens don't know anything about. Look at the response in Minnesota with this, with all these riots. When this first happened, Angie Craig had nothing to say. You've got a failure of a mayor in Minneapolis, a failure of governor. Just failure everywhere. Nobody's stopping it. Nobody's putting the hammer down and saying, you're breaking the law, you're going to jail. And we are going to protect these people's property and their lives. You didn't get that from the Minnesota government. Did Angie Craig come up immediately and just stand up for what is right? No, she played the political game. It was a long time before she came out and said anything. And by all appearances, it was just spewing out the Democratic Party line. Is a Marine going to do that? A lot of people lost their businesses. And as this spread across the country... Some people lost their lives. He mentioned that um, in terms of his education, he studied history first, which I have a lot of respect for. Of course, the way they teach history these days suffers from our problem we have with our education system. But having said that, knowing history helps you to avoid repeating history. I bring that up in these videos all the time. Those who do not know history are condemned to repeat it. So I think there's a lot of value in having a history degree. Do you want to do, do you want to repeat in America what the Roman Empire did? The Roman Empire didn't come out very well, did they? It kind of fell apart. Do we want to repeat that? Or do we want to understand what happened there so we don't repeat it ourselves? What does Angie Craig know about the Roman Empire? Other than watching an episode on PBS, maybe. After that, he went and he got his master's in international relations 
from New England College. And uh, while working as a Marine, doing all these special ops in all these different countries against terrorists, he gained a lot of, or as he's putting it, uh, where is that? Gained a substantial amount of foreign policy experience. And yes, he did. He had to, to do that job. Foreign policy experience on the ground. At times, he's commanding people from other militaries, other countries. Or at least he's responsible in some way for ensuring their safety and security as well. That's a leader. But at the same time, as a Marine, he knows where he is. This is where he is. He is in charge of these people. It's his job to protect these people and to make sure that they do their job well and competently. Unlike Angie Craig, who apparently cannot even control a couple of interns who don't respond to me at all. When you're at this level in the Marines, you have people giving you orders and you have to follow those orders. You know where you stand. You know the proper chain of command and you follow it. And as you rise through it, your responsibilities change. What's the responsibility of a member of Congress, according to Angie Craig? Apparently, it is to serve your own interests. Ignore the constituents who comes to you with a life-threatening problem that's created by the governor of Minnesota. And instead, send him weekly marketing emails asking him to help you. The guy, the guy whose taxes are paying for her salary. Or at least the part she doesn't get from lobbyists. I think there's a better chance. I can't say for sure. I don't know Tyler Kirstner. He might fail as well. I don't know. But for him to do the job he did in the military, he has. There's almost no conceivable way he could go into office as a member of Congress and not comprehend fully what his role is. I'm paying his salary. He is my employee. And the employee of five and a half million Minnesotans, and because he's in the U.S. Congress, all Americans as well. I think there's a much better chance that Tyler Kirstner is going to comprehend what his true role and responsibility is. And he's not going to go off in all these directions, you know, oh my gosh, I have this pet project and I have this pet peeve and I hate this and I got to stop this because I personally don't like it. Again, I can't tell you whether Tyler would do a great job or not, but I can tell you that it's virtually impossible for him to do a worse job than Angie, Angie Craig has. Because Angie did nothing. I went to her for help. That my, When I go to work and I pay my taxes, it pays for her and her family's well-being. And she didn't help. She did nothing. How do you do worse than nothing? Which brings me back to what I said when I started this video. When you're looking at hiring an employee, as we are doing when we vote for someone who our taxes pay for, an employee in Congress, look at them as if their performance determines the well-being of your family, as if you own the business, which we do. We own this country. This is our country. Not in the sense that she put it in there. For all Minnesotans, except for the homeless ones and, and the Christians and the conservatives and the blah, or whatever these people don't like. All of us. She did absolutely nothing. If she were an employee in my business, I would have fired her to save my business. She doesn't do anything. Would, would you hire an employee for your family business who does nothing and collects the paycheck anyway? And while they're on the job, they're over there maybe taking a little bit of perks from someone else, your competitors. Because that's what the lobbyists are doing. I don't envy what Tyler's trying to get himself into. There's a genuine swamp in Washington DC but Minnesotans can do a little bit to clean up that swamp they can clean up about one five hundredth of the swamp by getting rid of Angie Craig and replacing with Tyler Kirstner
And Tyler, if you win, and I hope you do, you've got to prove yourself. Or I'm going to be back here in two years calling for someone to replace you. Thank you all for watching, and regardless of what you think of me personally or my manner of speaking, for the sake of everybody, you, your family, your friends, all these people around you, please vote responsibly. Because I am prohibited by the state of Minnesota from voting at all. Because I'm homeless. Thank you.